Okay, well, I hope everybody can uh, see uh, the opening slide, and my apologies for uh, subjecting you to my visage, but I find it's easier to listen to um, a presentation, a webinar, when you have a picture, and it's totally unconscionable, I mean, you know, uncognitive in that respect, and yet for me it works. So, first of all, thank you for joining us today, and uh, I welcome, and uh, let's hope we get things going. I want to start by asking a question of you. And the question is, do you believe in magic? Now, I don't mean, you know, Prester, uh, Legerdemain, I don't mean stage magic. I don't mean the warmth you feel in your heart when you see your kids on a warm summer evening before you go inside and sit down for, oh, in front of the television for dinner. I mean real magic. I mean the power to, to conjure up demons to to do your bidding and the ability to look through a crystal ball in the distance and, and communicate and watch what's happening. Because I do. And the reason I do is a quote that Arthur C. Clarke made famous, where he said, any truly advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I believe we're there. I really do. I think that we now have magic. The limitations are no longer the technology. The limits are between our ears and perhaps in our pocket. So the question becomes one of, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to take advantage of magic, essentially, to make things happen? As Chris mentioned, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce myself just because I want you to understand the strange and unusual perspectives I bring to bear in thinking about uh, mobile learning and learning technology in general. I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate, and that's essentially been my career ever since, and I've been fortunate to be able to pursue it. And so that's led me to look deeply at learning, to look at cognitive science, to look at design, to look at the technology affordances, but it's very much those filters about understanding how we learn deeply and really what the core capabilities of technology are, not getting seduced by, um, you know, the hype or anything else, but cutting through all the smoke and mirrors and getting down to the core affordances and putting that to use for organizational performance. And so that's led to thinking in a lot of spaces, not just mobile, but games and adaptive systems and social learning and more. But that sort of underpins what I do. Speaking of social learning, when I, um, particularly in the, when I do talk about that, I owe a lot to my colleagues in the Internet Time Alliance, Jay Cross, Jane Hart, Harold Yarkey, and Charles Jennings in terms of helping me understand uh, in much deeper ways exactly how we can learn and think better together than we do alone. So interestingly, it's not about learning. It's not about uh, intellectual self-gratification. And I mean this in two ways. I mean, it, first of all, we don't learn just for learning's sake. We learn to be able to do things we can't do now, particularly things that will help our organizations. Uh, perform better. And I also mean that when I talk about mobile learning, it's really not about courses on a phone. And I want to get talk deeper about that. To situate this in, in sort of a larger perspective, I want to go sort of framing this strategically. When we look at the development of the people we are responsible for, the, the individuals in the organization that we want to help improve, you know, they start at novice. And they become practitioner, and then they become experts if they do it long enough, if that's their area. And realize most of us are at various places on several of these trajectories, because we may have a number of different roles. We may be a manager as well as a practitioner. And in the rest of our lives, you know, we may be uh, uh, expert fly fishermen, but a total novice in the kitchen, or vice versa, whatever it is that uh, matters. But the important thing here is to notice that when you move from novice to practitioner, you know, the formal learning methods are most valuable for novices. They don't know what they need to know, and they don't know really why it's important, and so we wrap a lot of stuff around. But as they become practitioners, they really know what they need to know, and they just want access to it. And when, by the time they become experts, the, nobody can be giving them the answer because they're, they are the ones who are the source of the answers, and what they need to keep learning is to collaborate with other people to move forward and address new questions and new issues. Um, I want to stop here, by the way. Please do throw any questions you have into the question um, window. I'd love to, to be able to see them, and if they come up, we don't unfortunately have a chat window in this environment where I could just be monitoring your questions and discussions. But if there's anything I miss 
or uh, anything that I'm not making clear, please do try and let us know so we can ask questions, uh, answer them, and make sure you're keeping up with what's going on. When I look at mobile learning, I look at it in the context of the larger use of technology in the organization to support performance. Oftentimes, organizations start with e-learning, which is either content on a web page with a quiz, or it's sort of a webinar like this. And one of the first things we need to do is move to improved instructional design and start looking at uh, better learning. But we also often start with performance support, where we are looking for uh, you know, portals of resources that help us perform better. And some organizations actually have e-community going as well, where they're getting people collaborating, working together, mentoring one another in, as ways. Then we talk about, to me, greater integration, which is about being more systematic behind the scenes in terms of our content development processes and content management systems. So we're integrating the IT infrastructure underneath. And broader distribution is, to me, where mobile really sits. It's about making sure we can start distributing these resources wherever and whenever they're needed. The goal is to ultimately create a full performance ecosystem where the tools are aligned to around the people's tasks and they're getting have access to hand the resources and support they need, whether it be courses or resources or people. And so in, to me, mobile sits as a level on top of, above uh, formal performance support and social. We have underpinning it these content management, knowledge management, learning management, social media systems, which deliver an should deliver an integrated experience of formal performance support social and mobile is, is a channel on top of that, although it does have some unique properties. And we'll get there in the course of this presentation. Roughly, the goal is to fill out this space. And the, it is not to have every one of these things. Instead, it's to try and make sure we fulfill all the components of the space, that we're helping novices at the desktop when they're mobile, and with social collaboration, whatever support they need. Similarly for the practitioner, similarly for the expert, we're providing the tools they need so that they are able to be optimally productive. They can do the task when they know how. They can get support when they need it. They can work with other people when the answer doesn't already exist. So I hope you're with me so far, if there's any questions so far. But I want to set the context a little bit. So now I've set the organizational context. Now I want to sort of set the market context. You can read the statistics yourself. To me, the point is the devices are out there. Because in the developed world, the market's saturated. There's not much room for market growth because everybody already has the devices. What we instead have is continuing churn in the devices as people you know, get caught up with the latest uh, shiny object. And I admit I'm as guilty as any other. I've got my iPhone 4 and my iPad sitting next to me here. Um, but, and we're even seeing this rapid growth in the developing world. And there are places where the only way people access the internet are through their mobile devices. And that's increasingly the case. And it's not slowing down. Um, and interestingly, you know, smartphones have, uh, are in some sense the ultimate mobile device. Uh, well, tablets have a slightly different space. We can talk about that. But, um, and they're going to overtake feature phone sales by quarter three of this year. Um, they were supposed to, you know, they'd only been 15 or 35 percent, uh, say, last year. But they're growing in leaps and bounds because the prices are dropping, the power within them is so incredibly useful. People are purchasing them. And you will find even greater uh, penetration among the knowledge workers, the people who really can take advantage of this. And people are accessing the internet from these devices, not just um, using it to call people or send text messages. Even the average feature phone has a web browser. You may not have paid for a data package, but it has a browser. You know, Maybe 80% of the people don't know this, actually. But increasingly, we're seeing, and there's people who only access the internet through their mobile device. And just to put a, a, a capstone on this, the mobile workforce will pass 1 billion in 2010. That's last year. 72% of the workforce is mobile here in the US. 
72%. Now that you may think, wait, you know, I can think of my sales team and my field support team, and that's not 72% of the workforce. But when people have to go on site visits, when people have to go to conferences and still remain in touch, they're mobile workers. And you don't want them un incapable of maintaining touch, being productive, able to contribute even while they're away. Increasingly, that's the expectation. And I make an annotation down there. Just if you're interested, next week, the eLearning Guild is going to release a mobile learning research report that I confess I authored. Um, but it has the results of their survey of their folks who are in, in large part representatives of the connected generation and how they're using mobile in the workforce and that may be of interest to, to you as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So we don't have a way to actually ask these questions, but oftentimes I like to have a way where I can ask people and say, do you regularly use a smartphone, a cell phone, some other mobile or none? You know, some people are restricting themselves, my colleague Harold has an iPod Touch. He doesn't want a smartphone. He has a cell phone and he has an iPod Touch. People are making those choices or people will have a cell phone and an iPad. But they are ending up just finding that the power of having devices, digital devices, to bring information in the ways we talk about. So the common question here is when we look at these devices, whether it's a PDA, which I consider the iPod, iPhone Touch, no, yeah, iPod Touch to be, sorry, <laughs> brain moment. Whether it's smartphone or a cell phone or other mobile, what do we have? What are we talking about? And at core, I want to suggest that we what we have really is a process, a portable processor with memory that we can communicate to, whether it be track wheel, job dial, touch screen, whatever. And it has a way to communicate to us. Typically it has a screen, but it may also have audio, it may have vibration, it may have a number of other things. It is connecting, able to connect to the broader world, whether it's you know through Wi-Fi or GSM, CDMA, those are the two cell phone technologies, so it's, it's digital data, or whether you have to only connect when you can sync, it has a way to exchange information back out to the world. And increasingly, it can sense the world around it, whether it captures the world with a camera or a microphone, or it begins to have sensors like a GPS or uh, uh, RFID readers. There's a number of different ways these devices can communicate and understand where they are in the world. And then they run software. And some of it's just the classic personal information management, like memos and calendars and events, the things that Jeff Hawkins found were the most core useful things when he was first developing the Palm Pilot to anything that we might be able to load in, whether it's communication, games, uh, and increasingly you can customize these devices to you. You can accessorize your brain with the devices, with the software, with the capabilities you want, you need, by downloading them in the form of apps. And there's a browsing market in that going on. You have to understand that the use of mobile devices largely is different than it is with desktop. So it is a digital device. It, has, it augments our capability, but we don't tend to use it the same way. Desktops, we spend for long periods of time, just a couple times a day, whereas a, a handheld, we may access a lot during the day, and, um, but only for brief periods of time. Now, this is a place where tablets are a slightly different case. They tend to be access for a longer period of time, consuming content on it or, or entering content in it. So it begins to bridge that gap, and it's not quite as portable. It's not always with you. Judy Brown, uh, the ADL's mobile guru, um, talks about, uh, oh, it's got to be the device that's always with you that you're comfortable with. And I actually think that that's ideally the core of mobile, but we do have to consider that when tablets in particular are doing context-sensitive things, or just being there because it's easy to bring them along, you have to start thinking of them in terms of mobile learning as well. Now, why? We are tool users. We do not adapt ourselves to the environment. We adapt the environment to us. We augment our capabilities, and we've done it physically with tools like saws and hammers and clothing. Aren't you glad we have clothing? It's a cold day here today in, in Northern California. Um, and uh, so the question is, if we can augment our physical capability, is can we augment our mental capabilities? And our brains are really good at pattern matching. And they're really bad at rote processing. And then we have the executive function that controls it with some limitation. But ourselves, 
Now, digital devices are really good at rote processing and complex computations, which our brains are not. So if we augment ourselves with these digital capabilities from the point of view of a problem or a far more formidable opponent than ourselves without this digital capability. Now, this is not unique to mobile in any sense. But the fact that we can now have that capability wherever we are means we can be more productive, more effective, learn faster, perform better wherever and whenever we are, which is a powerful opportunity to capitalize on. And the ways we do. If you look at mobile in essence, largely there's two uses of mobile devices right now. One is to access content. We do a search, we pull up a little reference, whatever, or we communicate. We reach out and touch someone, whether we send a Twitter message, whether we um, are accessing, uh, you know, calling somebody up or uh, you know, Skyping somebody with an IM or anything, that's typically mobile. You know, the content, and this is valuable. Having the right content when you need it makes us more useful. Another ability is compute. So we have apps that do things for us, like we can do tip calculators, which are difficult to do in the head. We have the ability to uh, look up bus schedules and things. We have the ability to more than that. You know, that's content, but we can tell what, where we are, and where we need to go and check for the very next bus, which is slightly more complex. And then a real intriguing one is capture, where we can capture the world around us for ourselves. And then there's the combinations of these. So we can capture where we are and share it with somebody else. So we can take a picture of that um, device that, you know, or that pump that seems to be broken in the context it's in, and we can share that with somebody else and get feedback and suddenly they're able to participate with us in solving the problem in powerful ways that we weren't able to do before. We, can, we don't have to carry the manuals with us. We can calculate you know, the, the, the cost of the uh, offer right now. We don't have to go back and calculate it and send them. We don't have to break the loop of having gotten them engaged in the selling conversation. Lots of opportunities to take advantage of these fundamental capabilities. And these are ways to think about what we might do. We can also think about our formal learning components. So I have said that I don't think mobile learning is about putting a course on a phone, but it is about augmenting. It's about augmenting our formal learning and augmenting our capabilities and performance. When we talk about augmenting formal learning, we can break it up. We can talk about the introduction before you come to a face-to-face -face class. We can talk about presenting concepts, and we can spread more concepts over time reactivating the knowledge, making the learning more effective. We can show examples and practice items, give practice tasks. And we can do this across different channels. With mobile, we have many more channels available to us, SMS or text messaging, voice. Um, we can call up and, and touch someone. Audio, which is stored voice, um, is powerful, where we can uh, take uh, any you know, presentations or speeches and make them available for access. I heard a great win by an engineering firm that their, their one group would write a white paper about what they're doing, the other group wanted to read it and couldn't get time. They read all those white papers into uh, audio files. Somebody just literally read the white paper and the engineers could then listen to it while they commuted to and from work. And they came back and demanded more. And, now, that's a pretty powerful outcome for a learning organization where people usually think of you as a call center now that we're demanding more of the services. Video the same way. We can take videos that we've captured and make them available for access or problem solving things. Documents, obviously, are the, sort of the mainstream view of a PDF that people can view. And even interactive, where they can be practicing what they're doing. And, and one of the things you do with a, a layout like this is just to start thinking. It's, it's a spark for thinking. It says, what can I put in each of these different um, areas in these boxes that might free me up to say, hey, I'm not taking advantage of this. This might be a real opportunity. So um, one of the things to think about, we ha now have the power to do with the ability to have ambient digital capabilities, is that we can stop thinking about the event model. The problem with the event model, the normal learning curve, you can get really good performance at the time. You can practice, 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 and they get really high. But after the, the learning event, 
it dissipates really quickly. Now, if you space that out, it doesn't get quite as high, but it sticks around much better. And we need to start thinking about this, start breaking the event model of learning down because it doesn't persist, it doesn't last. And we can make something that instead lasts better, and then when it gets reactivated over time, we get really high retention. When we talk about our learning goals, retention over time and transfer to all appropriate situations, well, the retention over time comes from practice over time. And digital and mobile gives us the opportunity to do this. So I'm talking a little bit about formal learning here. I want to give you an example of not putting a course on a phone, but of augmenting. And this was a particular um, case study we did. I did it with uh, my partner's Knowledge Anywhere for one of their clients. And they had a formal face-to-face -face course that they were delivering. And um, it was on negotiation. And they had a very smart and very good face-to-face uh, -face presenter, but they wanted to have a, a mobile augment to this. And the question was, what could we do? Well, one of the things is just so I asked the subject matter, what is it they need to know cold? I get kind of upset about you know turning everything into rote knowledge, and let's just make sure they know this stuff because it doesn't work. It doesn't lead to retention outside. But I said, what do they need to know cold? And he gave me 19 things we baked into this little mobile, and it was running on a phone, seven lines by 15 characters across, really challenging uh, design task. And we found you know, one of the important lessons is you don't need full sentences. You don't need all your well elegant prose. It took two separate passes. I hired somebody to do the first pass, and then I went through and trimmed it again. And we got down to just well down. Very short question, your overall strategy, then a quick you choose a response, and you get the feedback. But it's augmenting. It's giving you the chance to drill that knowledge you need cold. But wait, there's more. I strongly believe in having to apply the knowledge. And we asked the. Uh, the subject matter expert, and he had these sort of 10 sort of uh, archetypal scenarios that he thought were really interesting, situations that really helped understand the space negotiation. Now, his model had, you know, you understand the trust and need, and then he had five ways to respond. So we made little scenarios. First, we set up just the briefest of storyline. So you understood your relationship to the other person, whether you had good trust or not, whether you had a high need or not. And then there was situation. You open because of high trust, and they do something else. And then you have to figure out how to respond. And then you actually, he thought on that fourth one across, he thought he wanted people to see what that might actually look like in prose, to respond as a confront less direct. Um, and he had his five things. And then you would finally see the feedback. And he didn't want to say the right answer, wrong answer. So he said most effective, not so effective, least effective. But you got a chance to try it, and you could go back and try something different right then, or you could go try them all and then come back and go through them again. But it gave you a chance to practice applying it outside the face-to-face the -face experience and extend the learning. We went further, though. That, that was the sort of formal learning model. But my thought was, what if you haven't had the course, or it's been a while since you had the course, and you need to, to still perform? Is there anything we could put on your phone to sort of help you through the process moving from formal learning performance support. And indeed, he had these 10 reminders to go through and check on yourself, but he also had the negotiation process broken up into four top level steps, as you see in the, the top middle one there. And right below it, then he had four sub steps for each of those steps. And for each of those, he had several questions you should be asking yourself. So we made that available in the device. You can navigate through and figure out where you were in the negotiation process and see some questions you should be asking yourself that you could go out, do the information gathering, and make sure you're better equipped to perform. And with these resources now, you had support for performing in the negotiation, even if you hadn't had the course or if it had been a long time or you were only partway through it. So this is beginning to think of ways that we can put information on a device to make it useful for us. So at this point, I'd you know, like to ask, and I don't know whether we can ask in the question space or not, and I don't seem to have the uh, access to the questions myself. So I want to do two things. I'm curious you know, who is doing and learning already, putting some formal augmentation of, you know, augmentation of formal learning on a phone, or even trying to put courses on who is doing performance support and who might be doing either. Um, and at the same time, I'd like to stop and say, Chris, if you've been able to monitor the questions, are there any burning ones 
we really need to answer before we move forward. Let's take a look. I've been uh, going through some of them um, and answering. It looks like um, to, to your question that you just asked, the majority have uh, posted a three or uh, they're not doing either. Um, we've mm, got a couple of twos, okay. but I don't see any ones. Yeah. All um, right. So, yeah. and, and that's, that's okay. Um, um, it's still early days. The opportunity is out there, but it's only just recently that tools have crystallized to make it much more uh, capable of doing. I talk about sort of the low-hanging fruit. You know, take all your PDFs, your audio files, your video files, just make sure they're accessible for mobile consumption. But the tools that start giving you cross-platform develop are, are really just emerging. So Rapid Intuit has a suite, and um, most of the people with tools now are, are saying that they're beginning to show mobile delivery capabilities. Flash now has HTML5 output um, from Adobe's tool. But it, now is the time to start thinking about it, start putting together your mobile strategy. Was there any other questions you felt really burning, Chris, or I'll rock on? Um, I'll, uh, I'll paste them into, uh, into your chat, and then I'll let you uh, address them from there. Okay, great. That would be really helpful. Appreciate it. All right, folks. Well, um, so get your questions if you have them into the, the question channel, and I will um, uh, continue on. So when I, a long time ago, I was looking at, uh, well, actually, we were in a meeting talking about informal learning, and this was almost a decade ago now. And Mark Connor was in on, on the conversation by phone. She said, is there a model of informal learning? And, and I was reminded of this one. On the left is sort of the hermeneutic model of action. And you know, forget you know, where it comes from. But the notion is we act in the world when we can. We get ourselves to a state so we can do things. And you know, the model I would like to use is driving a car home. You know, and you can be having somebody in the car or be having a, you know, a conversation and drive home, and you, you'll get there. In fact. You may have an intention to, to this today stop off at the store on your way home and get something. And sometimes you'll find you've gotten home and you didn't ever do that because your thoughts went away. Because you're so well practiced at this, you can act in the moment and, and save your conscious attention for something else. But if there's a breakdown, say that the road has been blocked, whether it's road construction or uh, you know a natural disaster, trees falling over, then you suddenly stop. You can't. The conversation stops, and that's why talking on the cell phone while you drive is dangerous because if somebody's in the car with you, they recognize the problem as well, and they can be a collaborator in problem solving. But in the if somebody's in on the phone, they have no idea, and they're going at, 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 and you're, you know, it, it's breaking your concentration. So you have this breakdown, then you have to decide: well, what alternate route am I going to take to get home? And you might have to make a decision if this is some extensive road repair. I don't know about. You've probably seen the signs that say this road will be, you know, blocked for the next month or whatever. Um, and uh, you then say, well, maybe I'll try one of two different um, uh, situations um, that, uh, and then you try one and you try the other and then you decide which one and then it gets stored and you've reflected on it and then you can act so the next month you will drive this new route. And so that's the sort of model. I'm talking about, and I wanted to map, map that into um, how people, uh, how can we support people? So when there's a breakdown, they would like to just find the answer. If they can't, then they have to go into problem solving, and if they do and find the answer, they should update the information so nobody else has to solve the same problem. I'm going to move on with that, but I want to take a brief uh, break for um, answering some of the questions I now see uh, going on. Um, can Flash run on a smartphone? No, because uh, it, it's, it's processor intensive and it kills the battery. There are uh, a few smartphones that will run Flash, but it's, it has a heavy penalty as of now. And whether hardware optimization, and, and it's not clear HTML5 isn't going to have the same problem. It's trying to do powerful things. Um, someone asked the software when I showed the, the Knowledge Anywhere examples of, of actually their client's software. That was custom done in Brew. This was over five years ago now. And Brew was the uh, tool used by that client. And um, they asked us to develop it in it. And it was a reasonably powerful programming environment. Uh, 
what tools do I recommend? Now, I try not to recommend tools too much because to me, um, if you get the design right, there are lots of ways to implement it. If you don't get the design right, it doesn't matter how you implement it. So I talk about design. Right now, the tools are maturing. It's still a state of flux, but I don't have any one tool. It's very much horses for courses. Sometimes mobile web is the answer. Sometimes it's custom development. And so I, I, I try not, and frankly, it's <laughs> very hard right now to keep up track of all the developments and the tools. So um, I, I try and remain independent. Uh, differentiate between M-Learning and M-Content was another question. How do you differentiate between the two? M-Learning to me has to be more than content. There are times when content is the right solution, and if you're ready, if you've been deeply engaged in practice, content might be the right solution for you. Like here, I'm presenting content. But other times, to me, really, full learning requires a chance to apply and get feedback, and that's the distinction I make. Um, how do you develop and learning content with so many four events devices? Well, as I said, mobile web, it, somebody asked, you know, what potential content, how do we develop content when there's so many standards? Mobile web is a pretty ubiquitous solution, and also most of the devices now can show sort of common formats, but, you know, uh, PDFs are something that I think mo there are readers for on most mobile devices as well. Um, but you can also, and it's pretty easy, um, a number of people, um, I'm sure Rapid Intake does, uh, Hybrid Learning has a tool, um, On Point Digital, and more have tools where they can put content in and deliver across platforms. So there are solutions out there. All right, I'm going to move on and not try and answer every question and leave time for some questions at the end as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, ah, went too fast. So I took this a little further and said that an information need at the initial breakdown, you might be, just need some information. And this is when you see people Googling things and, or pulling manuals off or, or, or things. They might need people. And this is in an office, you see the prairie dog phenomenon where they pop up and ask over the cubicle wall, hey, how do you do this? Um, but it might be better to be able to connect them to the right people, both at the desktop and when they're out and about. And occasionally they recognize there's a sufficient skill shift needed, and they take a full course. The course is only one small part of the overall support picture here. Now, if the answer doesn't exist, suddenly we've got to go into a different mode. We go into problem solving. Then we need different things. We might need data to look for patterns. Remember, we're really good pattern matchers. We might need models or frameworks and try and see which ones match best to the situation and give us some relationships we can exploit to solve the problem. We might need people, but it's different people. Before, you know, at the information need, we had the expert, but there was no expert who had the answer, or we would have stopped at the first stage. So now we're at a stage where we might need collaborators, people with a vested interest in solving the problem as well, or process facilitators, statistical analysts. So we need different people. And if we find the answer, we really should go back and populate the information space. We either create a new resource or realize there was a resource relevant, but it didn't have the right answer or it wasn't comprehensible in the form, so we might edit or annotate. And the reason I show you this is to start thinking more broadly about how do we help people. We've got to stop thinking about, well, we take them away, we run an event, we got knowledge in their heads, and we send them back to workplace. It doesn't lead to change because it evaporates too quickly and because knowledge leads to the internet knowledge problem. They pass a test on it, they go out to the real world, and it never even gets activated because they've never applied it. So we need to break out of that model and say, maybe we can support performance with an information resource. Maybe we can support performance by connecting with people. But I want to start thinking, start people thinking more broadly about, how do I help the organization? It's not just about courses. And that's where mobile learning comes to the fore. How do I people help people wherever and whenever they are with whatever the right tool for the task is? One of my favorite ways, models for performance support, is the um, GPS, lovely device. Think about it. It knows your goals. Um, it knows uh, because you tell it. You say, I want to go here. You put in an edge, so it knows where you're trying to go, and it knows where you are. And then it starts helping you. Now, it shows you a visual representation, but you may not be able to look at it. But it augments that by using a channel that isn't attention specific. In other words, you don't have to turn towards the device to hear it. You can keep your eyes on the road, and it says, turn here, uh, turn in 100 feet. OK, now turn. You were supposed to just turn there, you block it. Um, <laughs> but 
it's really powerful. And then it understands as you go what's happening and adjusts on the fly. Now that's a really, you know, specialized model for a well-defined task. But I think we need to be thinking about this context-specific help much more appropriately and not just, you know, at the desktop. But now we can bring that sort of support to the mobile world as well. Um, Another question is, do I have recommendations for length of courses? Uh, sure. <laughs> but well, are you talking desktop or mobile? I don't see putting courses onto a phone. Now, there, I could see putting it onto a tablet. And tablets just have this interesting thing I've been blogging about recently in my blog about um, just this different relationship with the device. And if you're holding it closer, in fact, I don't think this one has come out yet. It's coming out uh, maybe tomorrow, I think, or Thursday. But it's intimate. You, you have it in front of you. You can consume it. it. Once we have the ability to interact with it, where we can start really uh, putting simulations on a tablet and manipulate things and experiment and then get feedback, I think we have a real opportunity to make that. But um, other than that, I think a 10-minute pop of a video or an audio spaced over time is far better than trying to put an hour-long course on a mobile device. There may be times when it works. There are, in fact, case studies where Busy executives couldn't sit at their desktop and do the e-learning course because they get pulled into meetings or the phone would ring. And they you know, managed to get around to it on the plane when their phone was connected. Their BlackBerry just couldn't do email. And so they actually got through the course they needed. But that's not the right instance. It's not the right form factor unless it takes a lot of special design to try and make a course that will work on a small screen. And instead, think about augmenting the form of learning. Just Breaking up the event and breaking up into smaller chunks and reactivating it, to me, would be the right answer. Um, um, and so, yes, I think of, you know it, what could be on a phone is a micro course, uh, of what I call LearnLit, um, because that's the name of the blog, LearnLits.com. Um, but there, I think you know there might be such thing as a micro course, but Instruction line hasn't quite caught up with this whole model yet, and I think there's some really interesting areas of, to explore in terms of what makes a micro course work, when could it work, and what would be the content it would and wouldn't work for, and also how do we start thinking about instruction line for an extended learning experience. Those are forward issues. I want to talk about, you know, it's not just about content. Also think about social. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Skype, you know, I'd like to know if we had a, a chat, the option, you know, how many of you are on Facebook? How many of you are on Twitter? How many, and if you're not, why not? Um, Facebook actually is a powerful learning um, environment and is accessible through mobile. Um, let me tell the story. There was a, and I heard this at a conference, where these uh, principals in a firm were really impressed with one of the new associates who was totally outperforming her colleagues. She was just learning faster and getting, you know, way outperforming. So they, they decided we better find out what's going on here. You know, maybe we can leverage this for other people. And they took her aside and said, you know, you're learning so much faster than the rest of them. How are you doing this learning? What, you know, what's your learning secret? She said, you really want to know? They said, yeah, yeah, we want to know. She said, it's the bathroom. The bathroom, they said. She said, yeah. The bathroom where I can pull out my phone and connect to my network and get help in figuring these things out, which I can't do because you block it through the firewall. <laughs> People are no longer just what they know in their heads, but who they can connect to. And this is a great solution for um, you're reaching out and being connected. And you can have groups of other like-minded folks who you can ask questions of and get support. You can create private groups. Or, and you know, there are corporate Facebook equivalents. So Increasing, you know, social cast and jive, and the list goes on, are ways of having networks uh, where you can follow specific people and have places where you can have meaningful discussions. Twitter. If you don't know about Learn Chat on Thursday nights, actually Thursday twice, uh, 11:30 Eastern Time and uh, 8:30 Eastern Time PM, 11:30 AM, 8:30 PM Eastern Time, as uh, every week. Uh, for an hour and a half on Twitter, we post out questions, and everybody answers. And the really interesting thing, instead of sort of a convergent thinking process, it's a divergent thinking process. And it's a great way to get good ideas, to see what other people are thinking. It's a fabulous learning opportunity. And again, there are corporate equivalents in Skype. I keep a, a IM chat with Skype open with my internet alliance colleagues. And we're always talking to one another, 
um, asking questions, cracking jokes, commenting on something going out there. We're constantly learning from one another. These are great tools. If you're not on them, get to, and you can't really, and there's mobile access for all of these, and it's not unique to mobile, but bringing that social aspect in is really important. It's the communicate part of the four C's of mobile. Um, you know, and capture the computation like the performance support and also taking pictures and sharing it with these people and collaborating on context. One more I want to talk about is, um, in fact, context sensitivity. This is, to me, the opportunity that's, that's new. And I don't know how many of you have Yelp on a smartphone, but Yelp is an app that helps you find local food and have, connects you to reviews of things like restaurants and bars and stores. The interesting thing is if you have a suitably capable mobile device that has a GPS and a compass so it knows which way you're looking and where you are and a camera, when you hold it up in front of your face and look, it turns on the camera. And you can turn it, there's a particular mode in which it's a monocle or something. But you hold it up and tell it what you're looking for, like restaurants. And it layers on, it brings in the camera picture so you see which way you're looking and it layers on the information that there's a restaurant over here, uh, the Bangkok restaurant, Nian's Chinese Bar or Bistro, and I could walk towards them. And in busy cities you can find coffee shops uh, and it will lead you there. You just start following the direction it says, you know, pay attention to the road, don't cross streets without looking both ways. And if you hold it flat, it'll show you a map if that's how you roll. So and the ability to start layering on information. Imagine an employee going to the same client, but they're a different employee. If a salesperson goes, what would you give them before they come into this location versus a, a service technician? You can give them different information depending on where they are. You're giving them context sensitive information, and that's something a desktop can't do. That's the unique augment that a mobile device can provide. And a second situation, and I want to talk you through this case study. This was a game we developed to help uh, sales folks. And you, it was an alternate reality game in that it didn't really exist. You didn't have this job, but you signed on that you get a, a message from your sales manager, and he gives you a list of clients. And some of them have phone numbers, and some of them, and some of them have email addresses, and they have different requests. And you go and send an email perhaps to the first one, uh, whichever one you think is the best candidate, and they would respond to you. They might leave a voicemail on your phone and they'd ask for some information. If you went to the, to the website for the company, which was made up, but if the website exists, you could download the document that they needed or you could download the wrong one and you'd send it off. And if that was the right one, they'd get back and give you a connection to the next person and on and on. It would play out. It wasn't a real game. I mean, it wasn't a real situation. You didn't have real clients, but it played out like it. And it came in through your media, through your voicemail and your email. Well, that all can be accessed on the phone. So, and increasingly, that's the type of tool. And so we can start creating an alternate reality that plays out over your life, getting you closer to the way you perform in the real world, and providing real learning opportunities. So this is, to me, the opportunity that's on tap is to start uh, helping us more increasingly where we are and when we are. So much of what we do talks about where we are, so it knows where we are, but we have our calendars. We know what we're doing, and it doesn't matter if we're meeting in the office down the hall or the, the, the booked conference room. If we're having a coaching situation with an employee, what matters is what we're doing right now. We could provide support before it. So remember, you know, you're taking a, a coaching class. Before the meeting, it says, remember, you know, right now we're, you want to, what we're working on is you focusing on making it objective. Don't make it personal. It's not what, that they're a bad person. It's just that this performance needs addressing. And then they might give you a job aid during it that says the specific um, a, a checklist to help you remember it. Afterwards, it could give you a self-evaluation checklist. How do you think you did? Or it could even connect you to a mentor. We can start wrapping learning around the real world, performance support and learning, and take those real performance uh, activities and turn them into learning activities. To do this, we need to grasp two things. We need to grasp really what technology affordances we now have. We've got to look underneath you know, the, the shiny stuff and say, what core abilities do we have? And we need to really understand how people will perform and learn in the world. And when we get both of those, we have the opportunity to really do something awesome. We have the opportunity to um, 
to to really make you know move the needle in a significant way on the performance of the people we're responsible for and you know really we have an opportunity that's literally in our hands we just want to take advantage of it can we take advantage of it we should the devices are out there people are using them to solve real problems in the world they're already using it to meet their work but what more can we be doing to support so at this point, first, I would just want to say thank you. And there's a bunch of ways to contact me for follow-up, find out information about the books. Um, and uh, MLearnCon is upcoming. The eLearn Guild's uh, MLearning Conference is in June in San Jose. And then there's the uh, Rapid Intakes having their uh, MLearn Development Conference. And I think, Chris, that's uh, in New York in, in September, October, sometime upcoming, right? Yes. And, um, and so now I want to get back to some of the questions. And uh, first of all, thank you for your attention and, and putting up with uh, me for this amount of time. And uh, let's see if we can answer some of the questions. Um, why Facebook is better than a laptop and email um, is one question. Why is Facebook better than a laptop or email? It's uh, because Facebook has ways to find new people that are connected to you that are there's other people and you can find out more about them so you build up a personal relationship with them and it has a variety of tools so you can there's an activity stream called the wall that has ongoing information and it has uh, ways for to share more things pictures and email is sort of one to one or one to a group but this way people can come and look at it as they're ready and want to um, Another question, our workforce has not reached, uh, is not providing devices at this point. It's difficult to envision, consequently, an unlearning strategy. Absolutely. If you provide the devices or subsidize and say, look, we'll give you an iPod Touch. This is what uh, Abilene Christian University did. They said, we'll give you an iPod Touch. If you want and are willing to, to buy, pay for the phone you know, contract on your own, we'll give you an iPhone. And so they made it simple and they minimized their costs and they simplified their support requirements by providing the device. And this can be, and if you, you know, subsidize it in a way, you really incent them to, to take on your device and make it much more likely that everybody can, can uptake. That makes it really easy. But that doesn't mean you have to abandon everything else. You might have to abandon anything that you require people to do, but you might make it available. And with mobile web, like, again, almost every uh, phone out there and almost every tablet and almost every mobile device, I think there's web browsers now in the Nintendo DS as well, has mobile web. So mobile web sort of gives you the ability to have mobile strategy. And so you need to look at what can we do. You, you know, you need a mobile strategy for you absolutely before you have devices because you don't want to just miss this opportunity. You want to figure out how you use it, whether it's just SMS for emergencies um, as they're using it in universities and whether it's um, uh, making information available for uh, just convenience. I can listen to this podcast and it will m help me at work and it's interesting. Uh, you know, make brief little things or any webinars we give. Can we make available for viewing on a mobile device? They can just see the slides and hear the audio. Low hanging fruit and you should be absolutely changing and thinking about your content development processes now to say how can we just anything we create automatically has a mobile accessible version of it because you can. It's almost turnkey already. Um, what can we learn by watching the movie Surrogates? I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> I haven't seen the movie Surrogates, so I can't answer that. Um, I do recommend, by the way, I was talking about the alternate reality game. Go see the movie The Game with Michael Douglas and Sean Penn. If you haven't, it's, a, it's not only a good movie, quite gripping, quite thrilling. I mean, it's edge of the seat stuff. Um, uh, but it really shows a model of as alternate reality game intruding upon your world and, and beginning to engage you. And it, it, um, so I recommend you thinking about that. Um, somebody asked about how do you separate out Facebook from with your family from Facebook for work? And as my colleague Harold Yarkey says, you know, um, work is learning and learning is work now. And, and so really 
increasing, if you follow what Dan Pink says, about having meaningful work that you care about, it begins to not be separable from your family life. But I absolutely understand the desire for that, and I have two answers. One is, you know, have a one Facebook account for your family and have, create a separate Facebook account for work, or really your company should be thinking about and investing in uh, a Facebook-like social tool for the enterprise that you can, and they're all it's mobile accessible. And then you should still have, you know, friends. You will have friends who are sort of not connected to work, and then you will have people you meet at conferences you should who are friends who share your interests and passions in your workspace. And that's a group you want to tap into separate because you want that group to maintain once you leave the workplace, whatever current host you have as your uh, job. You, you know, the odds are, they say, what is the, uh, the statistics, 20%, uh, you know, you'll have 20 jobs in your life these days. Um, so you want to have a group that's separable on Facebook and maybe you create a pi private group with them or Maybe you just send them independent messages so it's not visible to everybody, but you should have a way to connect with your personal network that you take advantage of for your workplace, but you take more advantage for you to help you in your workplace, and your workplace may have its own. hope that makes sense. Um, uh, What do I? Uh, another question about apps that are websites as opposed to real apps are both acceptable forms for M learning. Absolutely, if if you've got the right interaction, if you've got people can put in information and get the answers they need, they can navigate through the content, whatever it is. Web forms are great. You put in some information and you hit the button and it can do the calculation for you. To me, it doesn't matter how it's delivered as long as it's accomplishing the task. There's more you can do with apps. For instance, tapping into the GPS capability, tapping into some of these other APIs for hardware augments that are available so you can do more elegant things, more complex things. But if you can do it with a web app and that gives you greater reach, why would you not? Um, uh, E-reader versus tablet. Uh, uh, question about e-readers. Um, I think e-readers are great and, and the boundaries are blurring. I was listening to something on NPR where this person was talking about hacking the uh, Nook color and turning in and running Android on, it. <laughs> and so. Uh, but I just like the more cap the more capable device. When we looked at that converged device diagram I showed, the more different rich capabilities that are brought in. You know, with a, uh, an iPad and a Zoom, they have GPS. The Zoom even has barometric pressure, which is pretty cool, and temperature sensors should be coming soon. And then, in fact, somebody figure out how to do one on the iPhone. I think. The more rich capability, yeah, it's easier to read a lot of text on, on the e-ink instead of the iPad, although I don't have any problem reading on the iPad personally. But the ability to have interaction, to have color, I think we need to move beyond EPUB ebooks. I want to have a cross-platform standard that lets me put in simulations. I saw I just the blog that's coming up to, to today, no, tomorrow or Thursday, I think. Um, talks about having seen a, a comic book format, graphic novels, which I don't think we use enough of in e-learning, and embedded games into it. Well, imagine that we had a learning story, and then we had little practice activities that you know let you do that. What an awesome interactive learning experience that could be, b both from the engagement perspective, but also for the learning effectiveness opportunity. Um, iPhone or Droid? They're both fabulous devices, frankly. Um, I, I, I would say iOS or Android. And um, I personally uh, have been a fan of Apple because I was uh, a grad student when we were in a lab that was studying user experience. And, and if you care about user experience, you've got to like the tightly integrated. You may not like the fact that it's tightly controlled as well. And there's, you know, uh, but um, droids. Uh, slightly more open and more flexible. I don't. To me, it's horses for courses. Uh, I would try and support both. Um, with so many choices, how do you decide between Facebook, Twitter, Yammer, etc.? I think Facebook is very different than Twitter. Um, Twitter is its own unique thing. I think it's it's interesting in that it's almost a new model. Well, so many of these things just replicate what we've been able to do when we were face to face. 
and create ways to handle that at a distance. But to me, Twitter is, is almost something new um, and different. Now, Yammer is a, a Twitter equivalent that for the corporate that has been expanded to include a lot of Facebook-like things. But there, right now, and I have been in on several gold rushes back in the early 80s, you know, where everybody, a, the personal computer came out and everybody wanted to program uh, the personal computer and everybody, you know, the snake oil salesman came in and said, oh, we can do that programming for you and, and there was a bubble and then it crashed and some good companies went out of business and a few ones managed to survive and then we saw the internet bubble. Well, right now I think we have um, a social media bubble and anybody who can program a database is building a social media environment and trying to flog it. But as long, you know, go do the evaluation, find the best of breed, but it's the capabilities you want. Do you have a microblog? Do you have a blog? Do you have a wiki? Do you have a, um, a discussion forum? Do you have profiles as opposed, you know, which one matches and complements your needs and a whole bunch of other things? Somebody's doing it on, the company we're talking to is doing it on Salesforce. Go figure. So, um, Uh, I, I think I've already addressed the custom apps or online, uh, you know, mobile web solutions, whatever is going to meet your needs. It's it's very contextual. It's very much who are the people you're supporting, what devices do they have, what are you trying to achieve, what sort of device is going to give them the best support. There are no right answers. There are only trade-offs. Uh, so you want to make sure you're at evaluating the trade-offs appropriately. I note that we're formally at 11 o'clock. I have no problem sticking around um, answering any further questions. Uh, I thank those of you who have maintained your attention to this point, and uh, I similarly uh, welcome to, to go or stick around. And um, uh, at some point, I'm sure Chris is going to reach his patience as well. <laughs> but uh, uh, we will. Um, but thank you for your attention to this point and, and feel free to reach out or I wish you the best and on your mobile learning issues.